I hope you all enjoyed uh, that film. Perhaps enjoyed isn't quite the right word. It's quite, uh, it's quite heavy. Uh, I know some people can get quite uh, frustrated by its content, I suppose. It, uh, I think it makes the case against biomass incredibly strongly. Um, and it, it, there are some part, parts in it in which I think are maybe a little bit downer-ish, like it's a little bit depressing maybe for some people. Um, but the important thing, and I think one of the, the interviewees did mention it, is that uh, uh, emailing your MP, if you're based in the UK, uh, I guess if you're based in the US, contacting your representative, if you're uh, in somewhere in Europe, contacting your MEP, because the European Union obviously came up a lot uh, during the film as well, um, and just letting them know that you know, this is a bad idea, this is a bad business, we shouldn't be supporting it in the way we are. Um, in particular, of course, the Carp Carbon Not Forests campaign is uh, campaigning to try and get rid of Drax's, well, generally, I suppose, the massive subsidies that are paid to the biomass industry in general. Drax just happens to be the largest single recipient of those uh, subsidies. And so uh, if you go to the website, I'll flash it up again in a moment. Um, it's cutcarbonnotforests.org forward slash email hyphen your hyphen MP. Um, and there's all the information you need on there. Um, if you can't remember that, just, just look us up on Facebook or on Twitter or our website, cutcarbonnotforests.org. Um, and all the information is there. And I would please implore you, if you are feeling uh, motivated to, to take a stand against this, that's probably the most effective way to do it. Um, I know we've got a hand raised. If you would like to ask a question, please just stick it in the chat box. Um, and I'll put it to our, uh, our two uh, speakers. Um, but before we get to that, I want to reintroduce uh, Mer Chavis, uh, who's got some reflections on the film before we uh, move forward. It's good to uh, see you all again and be here. Um, I must say uh, that, Darian, that as I was watching this for the fourth time, it occurred to me that there might be one of those um, blurbs that are you often see in some uh, news reports or some movies that says parts of this may be traumatic. Um, even though I have seen it four times, it, it does have an impact uh, because what you're seeing in that film is so much of what I experience in my homeland. Uh, I, I'm coming to you today from the ancestral home of the Lumbee people. And we have been a uh, victim to this deforestation in our areas, um, starting back uh, whenever my children were very small and they used to go for rides, uh, we began to notice that the trees were disappearing and that has not slowed down. And so, uh, yes, I do believe that sometimes it might be best if we would put a warning up there to the content of the, of the film. I want to uh, speak with you some today about what is happening in North Carolina. Um, you've already heard that the North Carolina is the number one exporter of, um, bio, of woody bio biomass uh, in the form of wood pellets. And interestingly enough though, in um, Governor Cooper, who is uh, in his second term now, in his uh, North Carolina Clean Energy Plan in October of 2019, he stated that currently the wood pellet industry does not contribute to energy generation portfolio and does not advance North Carolina's clean energy economy. Um, and if you ever wanted to do any research and look for that, it's on page 25. Um, so he states that in his plan that this um, form of energy is not good enough for North Carolina. And yet you heard um, that we are the number one supplier of exports in, uh, in the country. On top of that, uh, we also have the uh, dubious distinction that our Dep Department of Commerce has given over $7 million in subsidies to support and expand this industry. And I know that you heard how uh, subsidies in the UK helps to keep Drax afloat. So we as um, uh, rate payers and as well as um, taxpayers, we are paying for this industry double. Um, and so I don't wanna add to uh, the trauma of the film, but I think it's important that you know what we experience here in North Carolina. Um, for instance, um, 
Indiva has logged over the period from 2013 to 2020, 300,000 acres of our forest. And this is in North Carolina alone. This doesn't include their, their presence in other locations. And Inviva is the big bad enemy, it's number one, but we also have DRAX in the United States. Uh, in the southeastern United States, we have um, four DRAX wood pellet facilities and then a fifth uh, transportation facility. Now they don't compare or compete with uh, the power of Inviva, but I don't think that we should avoid the fact that um, while you're receiving our wood pellets, Strax is over here also uh, clearing the trees. And my understanding is that they're now trying to get into Canada. Um, so after emissions from fossil fuels, and you know, we hear a lot about fossil fuels, keep it in the ground and um, lower the pollution in that way. Um, but after fossil fuels and industrial agriculture, Industrial logging is the third major cause of rising carbon emissions in North Carolina. Uh, so while we do not have the uh, wood pellet burning facilities, we are getting the impact. And you saw that discussed in the film as well. And this is, as I said, part of my experience um, on a daily basis in terms of actually seeing what the impact of the loss of the trees are. In the five counties where wood pellet production exists, they're all what we call in North Carolina tier one counties. And tier one counties are counties of persistent poverty. That means that they have had poverty over the course of a continuous 10 year period. And I can say that historically uh, in my county, Robinson, uh, that would be multiple decades that we've had that experience of being uh, in poverty. So what you have is that these pellet plants, pellet production plants, are in poor counties and counties that are predominantly uh, people of color with the ranges going from 55% to 90% with an average of 65% at the poverty level. So these facilities pick the first and worst hit. Um, and I, I use that term because part of what we experience with the deforestation here in our county and, um, and it's present elsewhere, is that the deforestation has added to the impact of the hurricanes. And we all know that uh, we're having super storms now. So when, you, when I think of that, I think of 2016 with Hurricane Matthew and then 2018 from uh, Hurricane Florence. And both of those were storms that were called 1,000 year storms, but they were two years apart. Now it's kind of discouraging to hear that um, a thousand year storm has come every two years. And we dodged a bullet last year and uh, didn't have one of those in 2020, but we're just starting up hurricane season now. And with the elders especially, they have been talking for decades that as the trees disappear, the chances for, fl for flooding increases. And so whenever in my area, in my territory, um, whenever Matthew hit, we had inland flooding that had not happened before. Um, you know, you mostly hear about flooding at the um, edge of water boundaries. But in this case, because of the tunneling effect that happened with the cutting of the trees, the, the water was coming inland. So you had people who were losing their homes. And with Florence in 2018, um, these people were hit twice because they had not had their homes rebuilt in 2016. So when we think of uh, the biomass uh, wood pellet industries, we think of a variety of impacts that threaten our life and threaten our way of life. One of the um, things that I want to add here, and I know we have limited time for comments, but from my perspective, what we're looking at is a call for a cultural change. Uh, and this cultural change uh, adds to and, and, and really supports our concern for the environment and how we protect that environment for future generations. Um, as you were hearing the trees being spoken of as resources, for me as an indigenous person, resource is something to be used. It's something, it's a commodifying of uh, objectifying of something. In my way of uh, being, 
these trees are a source of life. And you heard Dana Smith of Dogwood Alliance also refer to the fact that we depend on the trees for life. And so for me, one of the things that I hear that we need to be called to is a cultural change in how we feel about our relationship to the natural world. And I know that most of you here will understand that. And I want to leave on some positive notes because um, the last time that I participated in the screening of this film, uh, we had just received in our county uh, the fact that um, Active Energy Group, which is a company based in the United Kingdom, had started the process of, uh, of completing a facility, a wood pellet facility in Lumberton. Um, I'm happy to say now, all these months later, that that has been stopped. Uh, it may not have been terminated yet, we don't know for sure, but with the combination of citizen action and legal action, um, the facility that uh, AEG had tried to bring to our county is now in, um, in dispute. Uh, they have actually mentioned that they were going to move that facility, what the work that they were gonna do there, move it to Maine. And of course, Maine has been following everything that happened in North Carolina and are saying, oh, well, you know, just wait a minute. We're not sure we want you either. And I want to uh, end there because for us, um, this is the first time in North Carolina that a facility would not have been put online. Uh, that usually it uh, gets all of the permits it wants, it receives the subsidies it wants, and nothing has ever been stopped. The most that we have been able to hope for is to be able to restrain it and not have too much expansion in the future. But there is hope that through citizen action and the various forms of support that came with that, we were able to stop that facility at this point. And I hope that if there's another screening, I can say that it was permanent. Thank you so much, Donna. Yeah, uh, yeah, fantastic what you've managed to achieve uh, in North Carolina. Um, so let's bring in Mac. Mac, uh, if you would like to share a few thoughts um, and then we'll get to some questions, hopefully, if we've got time. Um, sure, it, it's good to be back again and like Donna, watch this uh, film again. I wanna go back and just say, start with a word about the wood pellet industry. Um, it was created when the cost of producing clean and renewable sources of energy were much higher than they are today. And they were promoted as a cheap replacement for coal and still remain to be uh, touted as clean and renewable resources. Uh, but with the massive drop of, of the cost of solar and wind and battery storage and thermal energy production, the economic viability of the wood pellet industry really began to be questioned. And there's now growing national and international consensus that the wood pellet industry cannot survive in the free market system without uh, these massive government supports, particularly there in the United Kingdom. And just to let all my friends across the Great Pond know, on May 20th, uh, John Randall, you may know the British conservative and advisor on the environment to the former prime minister, uh, Theresa May, published an article highly critical of all forms of bioenergy. And he stated, quote, the government's buy-in to the experimental bioenergy industry is a rare false step. But despite, despite intense and expensive lobbying, there are still major gaps in the argument for bioenergy, serious evidence that calls into question how effectively it cuts emissions at all, unquote. And he went on to state that biomass when burned, as the science shows, produces more carbon per kilo than burning coal. And he described the promoters of biomass as providing a fantasy solution uh, to climate change. So in the public discourse and even in this film on the wood pellet industry, the most neglected issue is the full impact of the toxic chemicals that are released during the production and their impact on the environmental and public health here in North Carolina and throughout the Southeastern United States. The pollutants from making these wood pellets, pellets are airborne. There's acids created that ends up on your, on your cars and homes daily. There's waterborne pollutants, and the chemicals that are emitted are associated with a riot, wide range of diseases, including respiratory and heart disease and cancer. 
So if this industry is to, to be safe and touted as safe, why are all five of the wood pellet industries here in North Carolina in census tracts in the poorest counties with black residents representing from 35 to 90% of their poor populations? And why are these facilities and counties in Eastern North Carolina that are a home to the largest population of indigenous peoples east of the Mississippi River here in the United States? So while we're organizing to halt the supply side of wood pellets here in the US as a false solution to the climate crisis, as well as bad business, we need to join with all of you in the UK and across Europe to halt the demand for wood pellets. pellets. And this industry is very economically and politically vulnerable. It will eventually be halted because it can't survive the facts about climate change and the growing opposition throughout the world. The question is how long is it going to take us? And if we were to stop uh, the wood pellet industry here in the US today and in Canada, it would just move to Latin America, South America, Africa, and Asia. So this is why the education and organizing and advocacy work there in the United Kingdom is so important. We need to stop it at the demand side uh, there in the UK. Again, it can't survive without the subsidies that prov provided. And we need to join together across this great pond and work with you to educate, organize and advocate within your communities and particularly with your elected officials. The elected officials here in the US and there in the UK are not fully aware of the harm of the pellet industry and have not been pulled and pressured to stop these massive government subsidies for a climate busting industry that can't compete economically against authentically clean renewable energy sources in the open market. And we're glad that everyone is here today and hopefully this will help motivate you to get more involved in the UK on uh, stopping and terminating this climate busting industry. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mac. That's, uh, yeah, some really excellent points made as well. Um, thank you both so much for joining us uh, today. I think your your first hand experience on the ground is, is is really valuable for the rest of us over here in the countries that are actually burning your wood pellets to here. So really, really appreciate you being here. Um, also. Thank you to my colleague Fran, who's in the chat right now responding to people's questions. Uh, I know Donna needs to leave uh, by uh, the end of the hour. Um, and I know for the rest of us, it's just getting a bit late. So we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, uh, yes, there was a conversation about soil health, which is so important. And another good reason for just leaving the trees where they are. Uh, fungi as well. Uh, yes, so we've got someone in the in the meeting tonight from Southwest Oregon, uh, where they lose millions of trees to wildfires every year, with no po possibility to have any generation of electrical power. Uh, I mean, chopping the trees down so that they don't get burned seems uh, counterproductive to me because uh, uh, because we don't want them to burn in the first place. Um, I'm not an expert in preventing forest fires, I'm afraid. Uh, I'm sure there are techniques for minimizing them, but ultimately the only way we stop the kinds of forest fires that we hear about every single summer uh, that occur across uh, the Western coast of the United States is to get more carbon out of the atmosphere uh, and we'll have fewer temperatures and fewer uh, freak weather events and Really, I, I think that's the only long-term solution. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know if anyone else wants to come in on that question, but I don't really have an answer uh, to how we stop forest fires more generally. Um, uh, is that your hand up there, Donna, or are you just... Uh... Yes, 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 go yes, ahead. Yes. Go ahead. The Menominee Nation, in Wisconsin, which is predominantly in what is now known as uh, Wisconsin in the United States, um, they are known internationally for their forest um, management. Uh, uh, cultures and nations come from all over the globe to study how they manage their forest. Um, Menominee has an interesting history that you can read about and I won't go in to, but in terms of uh, how they manage their farms, it is through other means besides burning. Um, there's, there's a number of steps that can be taken and I just wanted to uh, give them as an example because they have been studied, it's scientifically proven how well their, their um, 
their forests are managed and, and there all are alternatives to the kind of clear cutting we're seeing over against burning. So that's the Menominee Nation in, um, in what is now known as Wisconsin. And I'll put the name down here in, in the chat. Okay, great. Uh, hopefully, Clint, if you're still with us, uh, hopefully that helped answer your question. Um, but another one here, which I'm afraid I'm not going to really be able to provide much on either, but hopefully, Fran, uh, if, you, if you are able to hear this, um, we've had a question about industrial hemp and how that can provide lots of biomass with minimal impact on the environment. Um, I don't know if you want to come in on that, Fran. I will just say that I guess the point that the Cut Carbon Not Forests campaign is trying to make isn't, is that uh, biomass is being subsidized in this country as if it were entirely renewable, if it were just comparable to uh, solar or wind. And of course, those have installation costs. Um, but once they're up and running, they produce electricity from wind and the sun. Um, we are subsidizing biomass as if it produced as many carbon emissions as those two technologies. Um, and so finding something that's a bit better than our current biomass, which is maybe a bit better than coal, is not really the right comparison. We, even if uh, someone may come in and tell me now that hemp is absolutely fantastic, um, the amount of it I would imagine we would have to grow in order to produce the amount of energy that is being talked about by organizations like the International Energy Agency. A vast amount of, of hemp would then need to be grown. So I'm surprised if that were a long-term solution. Um, did anyone, uh, Mac or Donna or Fran, did any of you want to come in on that? Yeah, I mean, I'd, uh, I'd just re reiterate what you just said, the amount we're talking about for something on the scale of Drax. I, I don't, like, like Drax burns more wood every year than the UK can produce and that's just one power station so I think when we talk about alternatives to burning forests or burning plantations that stand where forests used to be we've got to keep those kinds of numbers in mind like there, there might be cases on a very local level where biomass for heat and power makes sense but doing it and subsidizing it in the way that um, Drax is operating is that it ju it's just never going to work. Uh, yes thank you Fran. Um, another one that came to me directly was from Jack who asks the the prickly question of do I think that Brexit is going to play out be helpful to our opposition to the biofuel scam. I mean, it's 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 difficult to say. Obviously, as we, we talked about in the film, uh, the European Union has had a big role in making biomass such an, uh, uh, an appealing option for government across the continent. Um, the problem is that we're now stuck with the Conservatives, who are at present at least showing no signs of uh, changing the policy. I believe there is some sort of, uh, there was a call for evidence recently, so perhaps we will see a change in policy. And uh, maybe on this one issue, we'll be incredibly grateful that we no longer have to play by EU rules. Um, it's a difficult one to answer, I'm afraid, Jack. Uh, we, I guess we will have to wait and see. Yes, Fran, do you want to answer this one? So somebody asked, is the carbon loophole being addressed by any politicians in the UK, Green parties, Liberals, etc.? And if not, why not? Uh, do you want to take that one? Um, yeah, sure. So that actually leads us on really well to uh, the Cut Carbon Not Forests campaign and why it's important to support it, because um, currently, uh, you're right, it isn't actually being addressed very thoroughly by politicians in any party like we've had some support cross party like as as Don mentioned like Lord um Lord Randall brought it up recently we've had some support from the Greens from um Caroline Lucas and Natalie Bennett have have all been been supportive but it's not being addressed in a really concerted way and that's what that's that's why the cut carbon not forests campaign came together really it's a very pointed uh, campaign towards um, elected decision makers and that's why we're asking everyone to contact their MP 
and um, hopefully, like if as many MPs across all parties are contacted by constituents as something that people in the UK think is really important, we're contributing to climate change, we're destroying forests overseas, we're polluting communities across the Atlantic. And if, if we really stress that, then, um, th then hopefully we can get more politicians to take this on because at the moment there really isn't very much noise being made about it um, yet. And I just want to say, actually, Mac has just put a link to Scalawag magazine in the chat, and that's a really good mini series of articles that go into a lot more depth about the environmental racism that's caused by the wood pellet industry. So and everyone I'll, should check that out. I'll be sending around an email, most likely tomorrow, to everyone who booked a ticket for tonight's event. Uh, sharing hopefully the video of, of this conversation we're having now, uh, but all of the useful links that have been posted in the chat, um, as well as I think probably answers to all of the questions uh, that Fran has managed to get to by just typing them out. There was some stuff in there about uh, COP and uh, some other bits, I can't see it right now. Um, but it is very nearly nine o'clock. I know Donna has to go, so. Uh... Well, I do want to answer one question. Just oh, yeah, a question please. about persuading the friends of the earth uh, Friends of the Earth uh, is very much involved with building out um, a biomass program in the United States. They've been involved internationally, but we're very much interested in, in forging the ties between the U.S. and the work that's going on in the U.K. Very little is known in the U.S. about, in the general population, about the opposition that is there in the United Kingdom. And we're made to believe that we're doing a favor by supplying clean energy uh, to your countries. And so... Uh, yes, the answer to that question for the Friends of the Earth anyway is that we're very much involved and I'm glad to see that you're a member of FO and um, will help us get further down that road. And now I have to go do some FO business right now. Thank you very much, Donna. Thank you so much for coming tonight and uh, maybe you. see you at the next screening. And just on the other groups that you mentioned there, XR, Greenpeace, etc., David, um, we are in contact with those and we get a lot of support from Extinction Rebellion in particular. I think Greenpeace right now are more focused on deforestation for agriculture. I think I've got that right. And they're doing a big campaign focused around uh, lobbying supermarkets to try and uh, get them to source their meat uh, more sustainably, uh, which is a fantastically worthwhile campaign and I wish them all the luck with it. Um, Yes, they're, they're less uh, focused on biomass right now. Um, yeah, and as Fran says, some local groups have been very supportive. Uh, none of the groups in the UK have taken biomass on as a national campaign. I what I'm saying. Uh, HS2, someone's just sent me a direct message about HS2. HS2 is a problem for so many reasons. They are cutting down a lot of trees, um, but it's important to just uh, mention very few trees from HS2 are likely being burned at Drax. Uh, they may be being burned elsewhere. We're being, we've heard reports that they're being burned somewhere, um, but our understanding is that Drax gets over 99% of its uh, mass uh, from abroad. Uh, the largest supplier is the US, but Canada and Baltic states such as Estonia and Latvia are also very, very high up on that. Um, but I do think uh, we should probably wrap it up there, um, unless anyone's got any really, really burning questions, because uh, it has gone nine here in the UK, and uh, I haven't had dinner. Um, so thank you all so, so much for coming. I hope you enjoyed the film. Uh, thank you massively to Mac, and Mac, please pass our thanks on again to Donna, uh, to the both of you for joining us and sharing your expertise. Uh, thanks, Fran. And yeah, so if you do want to check out our websites for either West Bristol Climate Action or Biofuel Watch or Cut Carbon Not Forest, it's all there on the screen in front of you. And uh, yeah, we will be doing more such events and we hope to see you at those. Thanks everybody for coming. <laughs>